Good day to you all and welcome back to the Eastern Bloc. And yes, I have gone mainstream. This is an actual modern crossover. While personally I don't like them, actually it's quite the opposite. I could say that I'd prefer uh, a root canal procedure, a live one at that, to owning a crossover, but that's just me trying and failing miserably to be funny. But uh, all joking aside, I do understand that there is a need, a market and a niche for these actual cars. So in the next few minutes, I'll try to briefly understand why uh, this is going on. What exactly we have here? Well, it's an Opel Grandland X. Uh, it's built on a PSA platform. Well, now they're called Stellantis, but uh, just, uh, just another way of saying this is actually a Peugeot or Citroen underneath. It's a compact modern crossover. And I understand why some people would prefer it. It's got a high stance and it gives that SUV look uh, that's highly desirable. Uh, you feel that you have a massive car, a very potent and resistant one. It will get you through any obstacle and weather condition. At least that's the idea or that's how I see it. Speaking about the design, well actually I'm quite appreciative of what Opel tried to do here. I would use four words to describe this look. It's elegant, uh, it's modern, it's edgy, yet it's somehow how subdued and uh, restrained. So it doesn't really tire the eye. You don't get overwhelmed with the design features and it's certainly no one-trick pony like the Nissan Juke or maybe the Mitsubishi Outlander who just uh, show you a quirky fun thing but it gets tired and old after a while. The fascia or the front end of the car, well I don't really find it quite that attractive. I sort of see what the Opel tried to do with it. Uh, it's uh, Well it's the same look at the second generation insignia. Um, it's not bad looking but a bit too bulbousy for my taste. Uh, I think newer Opals with that edgy clean Opal Manta look, retro throwbacks, while well, they look much sharper than this. This, I don't know, it's okay, it's, um, it's modern enough but not quite as impressive as the rest of the car. Contribution to this very edgy and modern look, well, the, the low uh, roof line, uh, the small windows, and this floating D-pillar, well, they, they sort of just look, uh, you know how in the past, the first generations of uh, car-based crossovers were, were sort of too tall, like, almost like vans, and frankly, they, they look ridiculous to me. This one, however, is quite the different story. Uh, if you if you squint your eyes a bit, you can almost see some uh, well some influences from the Land Rover uh, uh, series, maybe even the Range Rover Volar. I know this is <laughs> quite ridiculous right. to say. Nevertheless, I do see some resemblance and some tentative, some uh, some effort made by Opel to make this car look quite up quite much more upmarket than it actually is. Other design features that I quite appreciate, well, the fact that these uh, doors, uh, these doors have these uh, uh, rocker panels over them, they sort of emulate the sills of the car and uh, they, they're meant to give that, uh, that impression of uh, solidity, so the doors aren't floating over the bodywork. Um, this is a clean look, but also a practical one, because when you open the door and you get inside, you don't have to rub your foot on the dirty sill if the car is not clean. So, quite nice. 
In terms of mechanics, uh, this car doesn't seem to impress much, quite the opposite actually, but I'll get into more details. So it's built on the EMP2 PSA or Stellantis platform. What does that mean? Well, in short, that in front it has a McPherson setup uh, suspension and in the back it's a semi-independent, uh, semi-rigid uh, deal, uh, twist beam, uh, sort of like that. I won't pretend to uh, be able to explain to you what that is, but briefly I'll just show you. It's a C-shape, an H-shape um, subframe that actually holds both the rear wheels together. At least that was my understanding when I owned a French car with a similar suspension setup. And as a user, I can tell you it's not good at all, but this remains to be seen well when we will be driving the car. Other details about this car, well, it's a three-cylinder turbo gasoline engine, an inline three, if you will. It's got a 1.2 liter capacity and it offers 130 horsepower. In this itineration, it only powers the front wheels and it's mated to a six-speed manual transmission. But I'll get into more details once I drive the car. For now, just for the fun of it, let's have a listen at this engine. Inside the Opel Grandland, well, actually things are looking quite well. I like the sort of um, uh, I like the sort of surround effect of the center console and the dashboard. There's nice soft touch materials, and the build quality is concise all the way. So there's no squeaks, rattles, or anything. I. I see there are some cheaply made materials and I'm not a huge fan of this piano black trim, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. I don't think a painted parts should be in a car interior or at least in a non-premium offering. But then again, everybody seems to like them. So uh, the automakers have just, uh, well, they have uh, come up with a solution they have come up with uh, a response to a demand. The steering wheel, well, this is a low point because the leather on the steering wheel has been uh, very, uh, has been uh, very, has gotten very deteriorated over time. Also, these uh, painted trim uh, pieces, well, they, they sort of look too thin and too, um, the paint layer on them is, well, it's rather poorly applied, but these are just minor details. Overall, I like the interior, the driving position, and the fact that you can adjust uh, the driver's seat uh, on, um, on different, uh, in different ways. Um, there's a bit of leather wrap, uh, or false, uh, well, anyway, imitation leather around um, the door card and some uh, soft cushy sides as well. The quality, the build quality is quite nice actually and I might add here that uh, while although this car is a bit more expensive than uh, a Dacia Duster for example, the quality of the interior is higher even compared to the second generation Duster 
let alone to the first one which uh, was actually offered new when this car was launched so um, this is just a quick comparison I'm not going to go into all the details but this car cost when new it was around 18,000 euros and for that you could get an almost fully loaded duster but it still wasn't nearly as uh, well appointed at this as this car well in terms of build quality and space and so on now the second generation duster on the other hand is much more closer to what this car offers but in my opinion it's still not there so uh, if you have to choose between this car and the duster i would definitely go with the Opel Grandland. Other things to point out here, well, the instrument cluster is, <laughs> well, it's reminiscent of those in the early 2000s. Nothing, ex ex uh, nothing especially impressive or uh, worth uh, mentioning. It doesn't light up, it doesn't, um, uh, I don't know, it doesn't give you anything uh, especially pleasing or it doesn't offer any panache, pizzazz, whatever you want to call it. It's not fancy, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, but it does work and it does offer some uh, basic information on a color screen. Um, the center console screen, it is a touch screen and it's fairly responsive at that but it's a bit too small i like the fact that it's integrated into the console and not sort of floating all over here and uh, while i don't really like all this myriad of buttons it's like the steering wheel engineer or designer had some buttons in their mouth and they just sneezed and all the buttons while well, there was splashed or over the the steering wheel i i just don't understand how they figured this would work but then again uh this is the norm with modern cars they all have a myriad of controls a multitude of buttons where there shouldn't be none and they have no buttons where they should offer them fortunately this opal grandland still offers a basic and um a traditional uh, climate unit control with buttons and none of that silly touchscreen deals so in that regards uh, while well, I have to appreciate this interior space in the back well it's sort of okay and at the limit I would quite honestly consider um, spending more than uh, two hours on a road even if there are uh, two people in the back and this feeling of adequate space is actually uh, given by the lack of a central um, tunnel w which would normally hold the transmission so it's clear that this this is one modern car would i recommend long trips in this car in the back seats well two people yes three no it's a stretch but it's still better than some other compact uh, cars like the Ford Focus and Volkswagen Golf so I sort of get why somebody would consider buying a crossover trunk space is deep and ample but I don't quite like this um, loading lip it sort of in, in yeah it sort of impairs you it sort of gets in your way when you you're trying to carry heavy stuff uh, but the trunk itself is fairly spacious and practical uh, and also well have a look here uh, it is a space saver tire but it's quite chunky and seems to be pretty resistant nonetheless so that's a good point for the Grandland offering a spare tire and whatnot nothing really interesting to see here uh, of course uh, at this price range the tailgate is not automatic so you have to open it and close it yourself but such is the case with cheaper cars all right then so driving the opal grandland x and before we go on any further i know it's called the grandland x and not a grandland as I've previously stated in this video, but I just get annoyed by that 
tired effort to make something feel or sound more special than it really is. So that X in the uh, in the back of the name, I just don't know why it's there for. Nevertheless, let's get on with the review. So, as previously stated, this is uh, this car is powered by a three-cylinder turbocharged petrol engine, and. Uh, well, things, uh, things are getting quite interesting when you drive it. It's got that low inertia point. I don't know how to describe it any better, but it seems to be able to rev very happily and very freely uh, all, the t all, the, all the while uh, dropping the, the revolutions almost instantly. I don't know how that is, but uh, I'll have to look into it, actually. It's characteristic of all three-cylinder engines, at least the, the mo more common petrol ones. Well, as three-cylinder diesel engines were not quite so uh, easily available. The engine is rated at 130 horsepower. And, well, acceleration of the line is quite decent. The only problem is that once you go about above 2000 RPM, the, the bad sounds, they just keep on coming. Uh, it's got that rattly, gnawy, it's like a rat chewing on, under the bonnet. I don't know, I just don't like the sound. I thought that I could get over it and not mind it so much, but, well, I have to be honest with you, I don't find it bearable. I don't think I would contemplate buying a three-cylinder car, and this is not just, you know, the enthusiast side of me that's talking because, haha, we all like... We all, uh, because all we, all we do is cover six-cylinder gasoline engines or V8s or whatnot. No, this is not the case. It's a quiet and refined engine. In fact, it's so quiet that at low RPM you can hardly hear it. Let me just close the window. So the engine is very quiet below 2000, but once you go nearly 3,000 RPM, well, things get a bit... Mm, they get a bit agricultural, in my opinion. Three-cylinder engines should not be offered in this class of car. I'm not saying you should have some sort of 300 horsepower monster under the bonnet. Quite the opposite, actually. I get what the, the French and the Germans tried to do with this EMP2 platform. Uh, it has to be a refined, potent engine under the hood, which non-automotive, uh, non-car people that own automobiles should be able to enjoy. Uh, that's just not the case. I grant you that this is an economical engine. It's an elastic engine, so that means that at, at any RPM, well, within reason, you can pull away with this car. But, I don't know, the, the sounds it makes are, well, they're quite disappointing. The, interest, the interesting fact, however, is that uh, tendency to drop uh, RPMs, as I've mentioned. So, uh, as soon as you... Uh, stop accelerating and uh, disengage a gear well the revolutions just drop and also the vibrations drop so i don't know is that due to the fact that it's a well balanced engine or quite the opposite is that an effort to mask the vibrations and that would mean actual um, um, early wear and um, Bad, uh, bad reliability over a long time. I don't know, right? I can't answer that question. I just, I can't answer that question. So these, uh, so these, uh, the 
see sudden drops in RPM. They're pleasant and impressive because they don't transmit too much vibration, too many vibrations in the cabin. Uh, but the question is whether this three-cylinder whether this is a three-cylinder characteristic or is it just an attempt by the automaker to make the, the engine more refined and less uh, rattly than it actually should be in its natural design state. So this begs another question. If it's specifically engineered to withhold vibrations, will this engine be able to uh, withstand long uh, mileage? Gearbox changes, well, they're, they're okay. I, they're very light and precise, but they're nothing special. They're not engaging and, well, the gearbox doesn't offer anything uh, uh, especially impressive in terms of uh, speed or agility or sensation and whatnot, but it's just fine the way it is. Would I buy this car in an automatic? Mm, personally, no, because I wouldn't buy this car at all, but were I to consider an Opel Grandland X, I think it would be suited with an automatic transmission and a classical six-speed torque converter at that. Uh, okay, so let's cons let's say for the sake of argument that we are on a twisty road, which in fact we actually are, sort of, even if I'm still in city driving mode. <laughs> even, in, even if I'm still within city limits. Would I consider this car um, sporty? Well, I'll tell you what, it is very stable at medium speeds and uh, while it doesn't have uh, exaggerated tendencies to uh, roll or to um, bend in the twisties, but the steering is way too light and once you do three follow-up maneuvers, you can start to feel the car body roll. Uh, one thing, the, one important uh, thing the driver, uh, the owner of this car mentioned is that at high speeds when lorries uh, uh, try to overtake you, so there's a lot of wind uh, involved, well, this car doesn't feel especially stable. It's not bad by any means. Uh, and again, I'm going to badmouth the duster and say that this is actually much more stable than the duster. So in that regards, at least as a crossover, uh, at least, so in that regards, at least uh, when uh, we're speaking about crossovers, this is not uh, below the standard in its class. I'd say it's about in the middle if you want exquisite um, road manners, I say go for the Tiguan. Then again, if you go for the Tiguan, it will be, it will likely be much more expensive than this Grandland X. Steering, as I've said, is light and it's not particularly intuitive. It tends to uh, sharpen at higher speeds and become more rigid, but it's still not a pleasant thing and it, and it doesn't really communicate with the rest of the chassis in a way that would uh, uh, would engage you to drive more sporty. Uh, the twist beam uh, semi-independent suspension thingy at the back, well, I'll tell you what, um, I don't find it quite as unnerving or as intrusive or as uh, well uh, fun killing uh, sort of uh, devil's work I was thinking it would be uh, I wouldn't try to uh, take this car to its limit well I wouldn't uh, actually because uh, this is my one of my good friends car so Vlad don't worry about it I will not thrash it but uh, even if it were mine, I, I'd uh, refrain myself from uh, driving at the limit because, well, it's not that kind of car, actually. 
it is better sorted out than uh, uh, some of its competitors, which I will not name because I've badmouthed them quite enough. But, uh, well, I was expecting um, mediocre uh, road manners, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I understand this is a crossover, and uh, the fact that it's, um, well, it's supposed to do all things for all men, it's not sporty. Uh, the weight, this car only weighs 1.3 tons, so I guess 130 horsepower what this engine offers uh, is quite sufficient in terms of the chassis uh, and handling characteristics so you you wouldn't want more power than this actually I know there are more potent variants of this car but given the setup I think it's quite fine with 130 horsepower it will do 60 miles per hour in about 10.5 to 11 seconds which is quite acceptable in today's world but more important than that it's quite efficient and economical so I don't have the exact figures because I haven't been driven it uh, I haven't been driving it that much but I suspect uh, right now it's showing 6.8 liters per 100 kilometers um, but over a over the course of around 10,000 kilometers or so so that's mixed driving city driving highway driving whatever you want to call it occasional loading hauling and stuff like that so it's quite decent actually I don't really know of other cars that offer better fuel economy in this class but I don't think this should be your only criteria I mean at 6.8 liters uh, per 100 kilometers, what are you going to improve? You're going to improve a 0.3 liters or about 2 mpg. I don't think that's worth it if you want a good all-rounder and the money is right, as this Grand Land X was. When new, this car cost the princely sum of 18,000 euro and change, but it uh, it was uh, it was uh, sort of discounted heavily, I might add, uh, by um, you know um, crusher voucher. We have this uh, thing in our uh, country where if you give an old car, you get some uh, throwback from the states, some cash back to buy a new automobile. I believe it's around 1,500 euros, or at least that's what the amount was when this car was bought. So overall you're looking to spend about 20,000 euros for a nicely featured and uh, um, appointed uh, Grandland X. Now for a bit of highway driving. Acceleration is adequate for this platform and this class of cars. Could you overtake with this car? Yes, of course you could. Should you do it at every occasion? No, I don't recommend going over 110 to 120 kilometers per hour in this car. It's not that it's unstable, it's just not pleasant at all. The best way it goes is in sixth gear um, with moderate uh, RPMs. Let's try to do 100 kilometers per hour and see how that feels. So it's eerily quiet. Um, it's interesting to um, to experience, especially when coming from a rattling diesel engine that's two generations older. My own 2009 Ford Focus 1.6 DCI is well. It's quite the the shouty business. <laughs> it's quite shouty compared to this. That doesn't offer any pleasant sounds, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's just more, um, it's just louder than this car, much more so. Uh, thank you, uh, Vlad, uh, for uh, lending and uh, providing me with your personal car for me to review. 
uh, here is his link to his channel or here or I, I don't know where uh, I'll just put it in post um, go check it out he's a great guy and he offers uh, well interesting videos uh, also um, please like and subscribe to my channel as well uh, but also feel free uh, to offer some honest comments and feedbacks in the comment section below. So thanks again and see you in the next one. Bye bye.